So at the very beginning, we mentioned the DNA structure that is based on certain building blocks. That is the sugar, the phosphate, and the base. And there is a set of rules how they connect. That there is a lots of aspects that you can look at when looking at biological organisms. But I mentioned then and I mentioned now that we will be focusing on the genome in this set of lectures. Also, we mentioned that genotyping and in particular whole genome sequencing became much more affordable due to the so-called genomic revolution. But still, if we don't want to look at everything at once or we don't want to look at the whole genome, the molecular markers are good surrogates. For the molecular markers, it's very important that we know their genotype and their position on the genome. They highlight genomic regions of interest, for example, genes, as it was demonstrated in the where is the party at example. And finally, there are multiple types of markers, but we will be focusing on these single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP markers that are widely used and in my opinion, currently the most important marker types. So we talked about the SNP markers that are being genotyped with high throughput machines that determine the genotype of these SNPs in a cost-efficient manner. At the end, what we get are large text files that could be further analyzed. And well, these text files have a various ways how the SNPs are expressed or the genotypes are expressed for these biallelic SNPs. So these could be the various nucleotide coding or numeric coding. And also there are various possibilities how the missing data is denoted. Overall, the SNP chips are very standard way how to deal with genotype data in basically all the populations. And SNP chips with different densities exist for many of the species. So we spoke about different ways how to determine positions on the genome. Well, some are more straightforward than the others with the fiscal map in base pair positions being the one that is more often used. We also talked about recombination events and that these have major biological importance and they introduce variability and have major role in genomics. We talked about uh, the so-called haplotypes that are a series of SNPs and these haplotypes clarify which combination of alleles come from which parent. Of course, if we want to do these computations on a large scale or in real genotypes, we need to use computers for it. And there is a range of specialized software programs that does the job for us. And the approach itself is called phasing. And these phases or haplotypes could be used in a various ways, but one of the uses is the so-called imputation process, which is nothing else than filling in the missing SNPs to our data. Here we also have options if we want to fill in sporadically missing SNPs that were not genotyped for some reason, so some kind of genotyping errors or missing SNPs could be filled in or imputed or we have a different option when we can actually extend smaller SNP chip to a larger one based on haplotypes and information from these larger and denser SNP chips, perhaps even saving some money in the process because these lower density SNP chips tend to cost less. And if we are not interested in some very specific rare alleles and we are fine, with the imputed version of these genotypes, we can use these for our research. So we talked about LD that characterizes the degree of relationship between nearby loci, and it helps to interpret many other type of genomic analysis. It could be expressed or computed as disequilibrium coefficient with D or D prime, which is some of the metrics that are used to quantify LD, but these have certain disadvantages. The other and better way how to express LD is based on the, square, on the squared correlation coefficient, expressing that there is absolutely no connection between the two low size. So this is no LD. And when it comes to when it, the value is one, then there is a complete LD between two low size. In other words, 
if you see one locus or genotype in one locus, you can exactly tell what is the genotype in the other locus. And of course, there is a range of possibilities between zero and one that expresses the strength of this relationship. For practical purposes, of course, we use software to compute LDS at the end for all the other computations that we apply in practical genomics. So to summarize this presentation, we were looking at the genome-wide association studies, which are often used to connect genotypes and phenotypes. So in other words, we want to find which regions of the genomes are responsible for specific phenotypes. Genome-wide association studies, or GWAS in short, are very frequently used methodologies that work very well for common variants. They work less well in rare variants, especially if the effect sizes of these rare variants are relatively low. We screen all the SNPs throughout the genome, and at the end there are some significant SNPs that indicate some interesting genomic regions that could harbor causal genes for the traits that we are looking at. There are some problems we need to take care of, and one is the correction for multiple testing. And that is because there are false positive and false negative signals or SNPs that we often encounter in GWAS studies. So we should adjust our p-value thresholds. And after these are implemented, we see our results much clearer. We showed an example of the so-called Bonferroni correction, but of course there are many other methodologies that could be used to a similar effect. The other thing that we need to take care of is the population structure that can also influence the results. Here again, there are multiple methodologies, but the goal is always the same, to take care of this population structure, implement these corrections, and to focus our attention to the true signals that come out of the genome-wide association studies. So in summary for this presentation on admixture, I just want to highlight the main outcomes. So it is definitely possible to find out proportions of purebred individuals and purebred genotypes when it comes to crossbreeding and admixed individuals. These could be from two breeds, which is quite often the case, but the admixture analysis is also capable to determine breed proportions from more than two breeds. Even a relatively low number of SNPs is sufficient to determine the admixture proportions, and you can improve your chances and improve your results if you select the SNPs in a specific way, for example, based on FST statistics with the so-called ancestry informative SNPs. What you also need most of the time is purebred populations but actually you don't need too many purebred individuals to be able to determine the admixture proportions in your crossbred or admixed individuals. We are already at the summary for this selection signature story. So we have learned that the selection, either natural or artificial, leaves detectable signals on the genome. These signals usually center around the beneficial gene or genes which drag the surrounding genomic regions with them. This so-called genetic hitchhiking effect is actually caused by linkage disequilibrium, meaning that the surrounding regions for any particular nucleotide tend to be inherited together. And if this nucleotide or this gene tends to be a very important one, from the viewpoint of selection, then this spreads in the population and with it, its surrounding regions as well. So we actually see these small parts of the genome that are very same in the entirety of the population. Of course, here are also various options. It could be a so-called hard sweep, which is in the entirety of the population, or a soft sweep, which is in part of the population. Also, there are various ways to detect selection signatures. There's plenty of methods, approaches, and software which look 
for well, homozygous regions throughout the population or some kind of pattern that could be used to identify such particular patterns. Of course, depends very much if you are looking within population, which is then most likely you are looking for the homozygous regions, or if you are looking across the populations or in between populations, of course, you can use other approaches as well. So we are already at the summary for this presentation for the runs of homozygosities. So we talked about inbreeding in general. So if the two parents are related through a one or more common ancestors, the offspring will be inbred. So this inbreeding could be expressed also well, various ways, but we talked about the so-called run of homozygosities that are expressed via these homozygous segments that are of various lengths. The longer these ROH segments, the closer the common ancestor was in the pedigree. So basically, if we see very long ROH segments, then it was perhaps a few generations back, uh, this common ancestor in the pedigree. And if we see some shorter segments, then these come probably from a common ancestor that is further back in the pedigree. Well, these run of homozygosities or ROH segments could be utilized various ways. The most obvious one and the, or the most frequently used is to calculate the genomic inbreeding coefficient, but also it could be used to identify selection signatures with the so-called ROH islands or even trying to find some Mendelian recessive disorders, as we have shown in the previous slide. And to summarize this presentation on genomic selection, so basically we are after improvement of production traits that happen to be quantitative. That means that they are influenced by many genes and QTLs of small effect these QTLs are evaluated based on screening of SNPs throughout the genome, so in on the whole genome, and the important SNPs are taken up and the non-important SNPs cancel each other out. So based on this information and based on these SNP effects, we obtain the so-called genomic reading values. This is a really good thing because the genomic selection and the genomic breeding values could be obtained and the whole system be implemented whenever DNA is available. Of course, considering the supporting factors that also needs to be in place. When implemented, the genomic selection leads to increase of genetic gain because of the decrease of the generation intervals. There are a number of approaches and methods to derive genomic breeding values, most importantly, the so-called GBLOP and the range of Bayesian methods. There is also something called a single-step genomic selection that enables to evaluate both genotyped and non-genotyped animals together. So basically merging the relationship matrices from pedigree and from genotypes, enabling to implement the genomic selection in the entirety of the population.